And thanks for sticking with us over the past couple of weeks. Unfortunately, Dave and myself have both had either ill families or illnesses ourselves, uh, which is never ideal. But uh, you know, thanks for rolling with the punches and, and joining back. Um, we appreciate it. So I'm going to kick it off for us. Um, for those of you who haven't joined or maybe haven't joined in a while, uh, my name is Kendall Roden. I am one of the PMs or program managers for Azure Container Apps. So that's a recent move that I made. Um, was previously on the Cloud Native Global Black Belt team with Dave. So I'll let him introduce himself as he's on the call as well. Yeah, my name's Dave Strabel. So I work on the Global Black Belt team. Uh, if you want to connect with me, I'm at Dave underscore Strabel on Twitter. Awesome. Yeah. And Kind of with that being said, um, there are, there's most likely going to be a few more people on our team getting involved in helping these run day to day just as I make a transition into the new role. Um, so so we'll still be around, just might not be leading as many of the calls. So Dave will definitely be stepping up a lot there. Why the AKS office hours? So obviously our goal is to connect with all of you as customers and users of AKS to understand what you're doing with AKS, how we can make the experience better for you, um, scenarios that might be helpful for all of us to learn from, and then bringing in other people from within Microsoft to talk through things that we're working on, talk through ecosystem updates, tooling, that kind of stuff. And so I did want to call out that we will have a little bit more involvement from the AKS product group, product group moving forward. So as you'll see on the upcoming calendar, every, I think, five meetings or so, we will not only have an AKS roadmap update with, um, with Michael, who's been running that, we'll also have a subsequent call the next, the two weeks after, uh, specifically around security updates, which I think is going to be really helpful. Obviously, that's a topic of concern for a lot of you and, you know, even us in the field at Microsoft wanting to understand what we're doing and investing in from a security perspective. And those topics are just becoming so uh, so prevalent and so much work is being done that a single call for an hour, you know, every few months isn't going to be sufficient. So we're looking forward to seeing increased involvement from the product group and being able to answer your questions uh, super transparently around the, the kind of work that we're investing in. And then uh, we also have a couple of upcoming sessions following this week's session, one on Azure load testing, and I believe Dave, you added the workload identity one. So um, that'll be an interesting session as well. So we look forward to seeing you all on those. And we'll make sure that we're sharing these out via LinkedIn and Twitter just so that you have more visibility. And as always, the source of truth is the GitHub repo. So if you're ever in doubt or join the call and no one's on it, you can always check that as we'll make sure that it's updated before, um, before the call each week. And I will also say too, one of the one of the videos that I tried to upload, it was not because I did not try to upload it, but it was because it it was like YouTube was cutting the video in half. So I did try to upload the video sooner, um, the one from the previous session. However, I did end up getting it uploaded, so it is linked if you want to see the roadmap for um, for January that Michael ran with us. So in terms of AKS updates, just going to cover a few since we do have a public roadmap visible and we're going to be dedicating a lot of time to these updates in um, upcoming sessions. But I just wanted to call out a few of the, the major highlights here for um, the release notes that were, I believe, posted on February 10th, as it says. Uh, the biggest things here are the Kubernetes 119 deprecation and removal. Uh, so that's just something to be aware of. Obviously, as we do that, we're folding in preview for Kubernetes 123, um, which is something that's now available in public preview, and that uh, update went out last week. So I wanted to call that out. Another thing, if you're using Windows nodes, you've known that uh, as we've talked about these updates for a while, container D has been the default runtime, and Linux-based nodes, uh, the same will be the case for Windows node pools as of Kubernetes 123. So feature announcements, these are just a few of the updates that the AKS team has released in terms of feature enhancements or new available you know, uh, updates. Like I mentioned, Kubernetes 123 is now in public preview. Uh, there are over 47 enhancements that are available here, and I walked through them in a call last month, but I also included that slide here just in case you weren't able to join, and we can just briefly touch on a couple of the, the main updates that are going into the open source project with 123. Um, another couple of big updates that are available in GA are Azure tags for AKS, which I'll explain a little bit more about on the next slide, and then also the Sys benchmark. So this is something a lot of customers have asked about with you know, SOC, ISO, PCI, 
HIPAA, all of that. So we now have applied security hardening for AKS so that we can uh, align with the upstream Kubernetes sys benchmark. And there's good documentation that will basically help you, you know, if you need to take that to your security, security and compliance teams, or if you just want to have a reference for what we're doing on the back end to run your Kubernetes cluster in a hardened and secure way. Um, are the sites going to be available? That link isn't clickable in Teams. Yeah, Jason, great question. I actually have a full slide that I just put all the links in, so I'll drop them in the chat as we um, as I'm done presenting. I'll make sure all of them are available in the chat. And then I'll also make this available in PDF form and I'll upload it to the GitHub repo. So cool, great updates. So in terms of Azure tags, I thought this was pretty interesting. Essentially what this allows you to do is if you create an AKS cluster, you can now pass in an optional parameter called tags. Um, and what that will do is it'll actually tag your AKS cluster and associated resources. And this could be good for things like chargeback, especially if you're maybe running a single node pool per um, you know, internal customer or if you're doing multi-tenancy in AKS. I know cube cost we've talked a lot about and um, most of us are familiar with in terms of how it helps breakdown and segment costs, but this can definitely help from an Azure perspective to get a little bit more of a logical view of the resources that you're running and the way that you could potentially charge back to them. So not only can you do this on the AKS create process, um, you can also do this to a specific node pool, as I mentioned. So this will actually tag the, tag the node pool itself, uh, the resource group that's deployed for the node pool, and um, the VM scale set along with any VM scale set instances that are associated with a given node pool. And then even beyond that, I thought this was pretty interesting. You can now apply Azure tags via Kubernetes YAML. So for example, if you wanted to charge back for a specific like public IP address used for a service, we actually have an Azure service tag that you can now use and uh, associate tags with Kubernetes level objects. So I thought this was pretty neat and uh, something that I recommend checking out if you're interested. And there's great documentation on how you can you know, extend this. I will say you can also update existing resources, so it doesn't have to be at creation time. So that's another thing to call out. So if you weren't on a previous call, um, the Kubernetes 123 upstream release team put together great documentation around what 123 includes, uh, what it provides. I think the biggest ones here are the IPv4 and v6 dual stack. Um, graduating to GA, I believe, um, or stable is what they call it. Uh, pod security, uh, which is the pod security policy um, replacement is now in beta. Um, and then a couple of other neat things like, you know, an alpha and express an expression language that helps you do CRD validation uh, and all that good stuff. So there are obviously 47 updates and we won't go through all of them. Oh yeah, ephemeral containers is in beta in 123, so it's enabled by default. Thanks for that, Philip. That's another great call out there. Awesome, so I'm gonna to touch a little bit on some of the recent ecosystem updates. These were just a few that I found that I thought were interesting um, and that I actually didn't know about until I dug a little bit deeper. So the main point of this section is honestly just to maybe surface up some information that you could have found, but maybe only if you searched through, uh, you know, 15 minutes worth of, of articles and different uh, blogs. So hopefully it's valuable. I thought this one was pretty interesting. So Valid Cube is a new open source project and it's a collaboration between Aqua Security and a cloud uh, Kubernetes native troubleshooting platform called Commodore. I personally have never heard of Commodore before. Um, I'd be interested maybe if anybody in the chat has, but Aqua uh, teamed up with Commodore and released this open source project. And the goal is essentially to enable developers to validate, clean, and do secure YAML like linting in a centralized location. And uh, what's really interesting, or I guess what's a key differentiator for this solution specifically, is that it runs in the browser. So you don't have to download anything, um, with the goal being it's a centralization of a lot of other Kubernetes ecosystem projects and is really easy for developers to consume. And one of the neat things that I that I saw here is Aqua. One of the things that you know we obviously know about them is that they do container security and runtime security, and uh, so Trivi, their open source container runtime solution for runtime scanning, is actually integrated into Valid Cube. So they're going to do things like validating your config files, uh, cleaning your YAML, like doing YAML linting, um, scanning for vulnerabilities and container images that are referenced in your YAML. Um, so I thought this was I thought this was pretty cool, and I'm interested interested to see if there's uptake here. Uh, another 
partnership, um, Datadog acquired CoScreen. Once again, another company that I'd actually never heard of before. But what's interesting is to me, when I read up on it, it sounded sort of similar to like a VS Code live share situation. So essentially with CoScreen, it's a, um, a platform where people can collaborate to do uh, like code sharing and debugging, whether it's through a terminal or an IDE. Um, and so I think Datadog is, is yeah, yeah, Ryan, yeah. Do you want to say anything about this, by the way, Ryan? Like, do you know much about this? You're welcome to, to speak on it. Yeah, we're, we're going to have more info about this shortly. Oh, perfect. Okay, cool. Yeah, so I think this is pretty neat. Um, it sounds like taking, you know, security to the next level and making it really feasible to, to troubleshoot and figure out how you can actually action potential Datadog results or something via screen sharing and, and collaboration remotely, which I think is a neat concept. So I'm curious to see how, how that evolves. And hopefully Ryan can give us an update. Maybe that's a future session. And then Sysdig and Sneak, another partnership. So everything I focused on today was a lot of collaboration. We love to see it. So uh, Sysdig, obviously a big in the container and just general security space, and then Sneak really focused specifically on container security. So Sneak has an offering for developers that allow them to get instantaneous feedback around potential vulnerabilities and things like their base images before they actually go through the entire CI/CD process. Like they have CI/CD tooling, but you can also do it directly in your IDE. And What's interesting, and I will say I had this feedback when I used the tool, is that you just get this insane outpouring of a ton of different results, and you don't know how to focus, right? Like your base image, which sometimes you're using an upstream image or an image that you don't have control over the contents, um, are super bloated and have a ton of vulnerabilities that you really don't have direct capability to, uh, to go and fix. And so what's neat is Sysdig, with its runtime capabilities, is actually going to marry um, its technology with what Sneak is doing in order to help you determine, hey, okay, yes, in your build process, you might have a ton of vulnerable packages, but only a subset of those is actually being used by the container at runtime. Therefore, if we know what's being used by the container at runtime, we can prioritize <clears throat> better the type of fixes that we need the developers to focus on. So to me, that's going to be really beneficial just in helping weed out the vulnerabilities that aren't going to be, you know, P0 or, or number one priority in order to focus on those that will actually be exploitable at runtime when the container is executing. So I think this is neat. Once again, super curious to see how it plays out. Um, and then the last thing that I wanted to share is the cloud native reports are coming out, right? Like as we get into 2022, there's new 2022 reports. There's a lot of trend articles a lot of insight into how Kubernetes grew over the past year. So the CNCF did their annual survey, and then I believe Datadog might also have another one that talks a lot about just container adoption in general, Kubernetes adoption. It's crazy how much it has grown in the past year or just like even since 2016, just like the production usage of containers and Kubernetes is exponential um, in, in terms of how it's grown. So if you're interested in just checking these out or if you ever have to do presentations that have, you know, 2014 stats around Kubernetes adoption and container usage, you can go refresh your charts um, with these new sources. So I, uh, I thought these were interesting to look through and really well done. This is just a slide that I can copy and paste all these links. So I will copy and paste these whenever I'm done uh, with the presentation. So let's get into to container apps. So Super curious, um, just for those of you on the call, I would love to see a show of hands if you can just use the raise hand feature in Teams of like, how many of you have explored or played around with Azure Container Apps so far? Um, I kind of want to differentiate how many maybe more experienced users we have versus people who, who maybe don't have as much context. Okay, or I'm seeing it, I'm seeing it, okay. Cool. So we had we had like four or so five people who have said they've played around with it. Um, I think that's a great number because we are going to cut touch a little bit on some of the basics. And part of that's just specifically because we're still in preview and we're still working on a lot of the features, um, but would love to just make this interactive. So feel free to ask any questions uh, while I'm here. I would love to answer as many of them as I can. And I, I stole a few of these slides from one of my old teammates on the GBB team just because I think it does a really good job articulating you know, a lot of our experiences are just things that we're familiar with and know about Kubernetes. So let's get into the thick of this. Um, 
So I loved this slide and I felt like I had to bring it in. So Kubernetes so far, I just think this is a really good slide because even though we all have seen the memes and we've heard the jokes um, and we love Kubernetes all the same, it's still sort of true, right? Like one time I tried to explain Kubernetes to someone then we both didn't understand it. Um, if any of y'all have watched Squid Game, you know what I thought Kubernetes would be like, what it's actually like. Um, so I just thought this was this was funny, right? Because at the end of the day, as even though Kubernetes is a really incredible platform with a lot of capabilities, it's not easy. And I don't think any of us after using it would say it's easy. But then again, you know, not much within the technology space is super easy these this day these days with the number of options we have, number of projects, the number of collaborations. So it can be challenging, right? And AKS is a great solution, and we obviously all have used it, and we love it, and it serves a major need. Um, however, we understand that there are still operation operational burdens and complexities that come to managing AKS. And that's true of any managed service. Um, very rarely do we see a fully managed Kubernetes platform that solves every single problem while giving us the flexibility that we need. Um, and I think that that's a really fine line. And um, we've seen levels of abstraction getting added onto Kubernetes for you know the past several years. And there's a lot of things that have worked well and other things that haven't worked so well. And so uh, when we were thinking about what we wanted to do um, from an Azure Container Ops perspective or even just an Azure perspective, it was really more how do we marry some of the benefits of the platform as a service experience that we've done really well with App Service and bring that into the container space because we haven't really done that super well. And uh, you know, one of the challenges that comes with that is obviously figuring out what the trade-offs are in terms of level of flexibility and granular control over how Kubernetes is operating and the portability that you want, while also providing a space for customers who may not need as much portability or may not need to expose them as much of those capabilities. So as we've I mean, at least from my perspective as a PM, obviously, uh, for those of you who have been on the call and who know how passionate I am about Kubernetes and the cloud native ecosystem in general, um, I'm really focused on a lot of the third party integrations, the open source integrations, uh, the portability story for container apps, because we want to make it where if a customer didn't necessarily have the resources or the team or um, the skill set to run on Kubernetes themselves, Azure Container Apps could be a really good option for them. But if for whatever reason they needed to grow and evolve and move to a an Azure Kubernetes sor service or another managed service, that we can help lower the barrier of um, of migration. So that's that's one of the areas that I'm super focused on. But uh, I think we can all agree, while AKS is really great and for a lot of customers provides what they need, for some customers it provides more than they actually uh, are capable of managing. So um, this is, uh, once again, another slide from Brian that I thought was well done. So Kelsey Hightower is pretty big in the cloud native community, and he did he did summarize this pretty well on his as Twitter, right? All you need is Linux, Docker, Kubernetes, Istio, Prometheus, right? Like the list goes on and on about how we can productionize a Kubernetes cluster and really make it usable for not only our developers, but have visibility from an operations perspective. And so there really is a lack of portable PaaS options built on top of Kubernetes uh, that give you the power of what the platform provides without necessarily uh, dictating as much overhead for um, for end users. And that's that's where Azure Container Ops was born. So it's built on top of Kubernetes, um, but the complexity of Kubernetes can sometimes be a blocker from customers being able to truly embrace microservices or deploy their containers in a way where they get some of these uh, capabilities that they'd otherwise have to set up themselves manually on top of a, an orchestrator. So I'll talk a little bit about what some of the core themes are for the product. And once again, I'm happy to answer questions as we go through, but some of this is in flight. So I ask that you, uh, you know, keep that in mind. I'm not trying to be, you know, uh, by any means a uh, keeper of secrets, by, uh, but I do want to be cognizant of the fact that we are in preview and a lot of engineering investments and considerations are being made every single day about the direction of the platform. And so there's a lot that, you know, at this time might not be like the perfect answer for you, but I'd love to hear what those questions are. So scaling uh, with serverless containers. So, you know, the goal here is really to provide some of that uh, like Lambda or Azure Functions capability that you'll see uh, with a scale to zero functionality on containers. And for all of you, you know how Kata works for the most part. Um, the Kubernetes event-driven autoscaler. Um, we've had sessions on it, I believe, on this very call. 
And the goal of that is, right, I can go take a Helm chart, deploy CADA to my AKS cluster, or even use the CADA extension, which is current be, currently being invested in by the AKS team. And that provides me to extend the horizontal pod auto scaler capabilities to get that um, you know, one to zero and zero to one scale. Um, and then obviously from there, uh, we can let the horizontal pod auto scaler and the customization of CADA take over. And so what we're providing in container apps is essentially CADA is a core part of our platform. And um, you know, customers who want to make use of this don't have to worry about the management or deployment of CADA, uh, the versioning of CADA, any of that. We're handling that for you on the back end. And we make it super consumable for developers who want to scale, not just on things like HTTP requests, um, but also obviously any of the event event driven triggers that Keta supports. Now, one of the things I will say is that as we have more customers using the platform, uh, we're more aware of what some of the limitations are in terms of are there going to be certain Keta scalers that we don't support, um, or are there going to be issues that arise when a customer tries to use one of the scalers that maybe we didn't have in our test suite. So all of that's feasible just from a transparency perspective. Um, so obviously one of our big areas of focus will be making sure we have a really integrated testing suite and that we are very clear in documenting what is and isn't available via the managed platform. So uh, with the scale to zero capability, obviously that changes the, the pricing model. So if we're comparing it to AKS, which I'm doing specifically because this is an AKS based audience, um, right now, right, with Kubernetes clusters, you pay for the underlying nodes and the underlying compute, but really the Kubernetes API management, the control plane management is, uh, you know, is, is free for you to use unless you opt into the SLA. Uh, our service works a little bit different in that customers aren't really going to be thinking about underlying compute since it's more consumption based. So instead, you'll be focused more on the, um, you know, pay as you use the container. So the way that this will work, and I think I can explain this pretty well um, because y'all are such a technical audience. So the way that we'll do billing, and we are putting together some documentation around this, is essentially if your container scales to zero, when it scales to zero, there's no cost. So as long as the CPU threshold and the traffic um, that we're monitoring is below a certain threshold, your container um, will automatically scale down to zero and you'll pay nothing. Now. The challenge with that is the same challenge with any serverless platform or any CADA scaler you would use inside of a Kubernetes cluster. If you choose to scale down to zero, you're going to incur the cold start, which a lot of customers are like, hey, I have a latency sensitive workload. Scale to zero is not feasible for me. So we provide the ability to obviously set your min replicas to one or two or five or 10, whatever that might look like for your baseline workload. And then what's nice from a billing perspective is let's say that your minimum replicas is 100. You had a lot of traffic, you, you scaled out to 200. So once the traffic starts to drain for these bursty workloads and um, the CPU begins to eliminate and you start scaling back down to your minimum replica count, which would be 100. Once you hit your minimum replica count and your CPU threshold and the traffic that we're monitoring hits a certain threshold, you're, you're only going to incur an idle charge. So you're not going, going to be charged you know, $0 because we are keeping those containers running. However, because you're not using them and they're sitting in an idle mode, um, we'll only charge you a sub, uh, you know, a subset of the of the billing cost. And I think it's like pennies on the hour or something. So I, I can't speak directly to the pricing model, but we are publishing that via the um, pricing page, and we'll have good documentation on it. But that should at least help you understand from a pricing perspective. It's really more workload and 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 not compute, which is opposite of how you think about AKS right now. Okay, so we've got the serverless scale um, and the scale to zero capability. And then in addition, you uh, those of you who once again know me, which I've said a couple of times, because uh, I think most of you do join these calls, we've done talks on Dapper as well, uh, the distributed application runtime. It's a, an open source project that I super love, which makes essentially uh, creating portable microservices that leverage a lot of the distributed capabilities and fail safes that you would need in order to really architect microservices well um, without letting all of the plumbing bleed into your application code is that's essentially what Dapper um, came onto the scene to solve. It's a CNCF project and um, also there is an extension or um, I think they're called extensions on Kubernetes. I know they've done some changes uh, to the naming convention there, but you can use Dapper in a managed sense on top of AKS. So most of you are probably familiar with that capability. So we've um, done something similar in that Dapper is baked into the platform. And 
Uh, customers can make use of Dapper by essentially just enabling a container app and saying they want it to have a Dapper sidecar injected, similar to how Kubernetes would you know, create an annotation and the operator would then inject the sidecar. It works very similar um, because we are running on top of Kubernetes. So we support this sidecar model um, for more than just um, for, da for more than just Dapper, but we do su support Dapper basically out of the box. Uh, one of the things that we're working on is documenting some of the nuances in terms of how we've implemented Dapper. Uh, so for customers who are running an AKS, like many of you who are very familiar with Helm, who understand how to do your upgrades and who understand how to use the features of Kubernetes, who are doing secure multi-tenancy via like logical isolation, it would probably be a bit of a stretch for you to then retrofit all of that capability into container apps, right? Our goal is not to be managed AKS because AKS has a lot of great management tooling already and will most likely continue to enhance that, which I think is really beneficial to the AKS user community. I think our goal, once again, is to really fit that PaaS model. Um, I've enjoyed meeting with a lot of customers who are using Docker Compose in order to run their services and who need a scale, but maybe not quite the scale that Kubernetes provides, but maybe more so than something like they can get an app service. Um, but we've also talked to customers who have really crazy scalable workloads, but just don't necessarily need uh, some of the uh, granular capabilities within AKS. Um, and maybe this is a good fit for, for smaller teams within your organization who don't necessarily have uh, the AKS infrastructure or SRE team in order to operationalize the platform. So I love the idea of having Dapper baked in and making that super consumable. And uh, this is something that I am very much advocating for within the product. So if you run into issues with, with Dapper or if you have suggestions around implementation, we are super open to hearing that. I personally, like my... As Dave Strabel would say and did say on the KubeCon stage, my DMs are open. Yes, he did say that. Let's all clap for him virtually because that's still hilarious and I'll never forget it. Um, but my DMs truly are open when it comes to thoughts and feedback around this product and where we take it moving forward. And we're working directly with the Dapper engineering team uh, that built the product in order to make sure that we take into consideration a lot of these edge cases that, um, that we need to, to think about as we bring this into the fold of the service. Oh, and I didn't mention, but... Um, we are working to on doing, you know, DevOps integration. So this is definitely part of the, um, you know, investment areas for preview and toward GA and and, and here thereafter. Um, right now we have pretty simple scaffolding to get up and running pretty quickly with GitHub Actions. However, there's definitely um, there's definitely a lot that I think we can do to enhance this, and I think you'll continue to see. Uh, integrations specifically have privy. To, I'm privy to to our investments here because, like I said, I'm on the team now and, and super excited to see how we can continue to bring um, to bring deeper integration from a CI/CD perspective. So, um, okay, what code changes do we need to make? Raj asked to migrate an existing application running on AKS to App Container. So, uh, in order to migrate from an AKS to a Container apps, it's a great question, and we are. We're, we're thinking about putting together uh, great guidance around more of like the container apps to AKS migration because we do see that being a more um, probably common scenario path for customers. However, if you're running on AKS, for example, and you were struggling, yeah, Philip, I'll get to that too. Um, and you're struggling, you know, with AKS just because it's a bit much for a specific team or from an operational perspective. There really aren't specific code changes, right? Because your container, your container itself is that unit of portability. So I would think, if anything, uh, you know, we don't support native Kubernetes configuration. So like you couldn't just take your Helm chart and deploy it to container apps because we've simplified the uh, deployment spec in order to help abstract and um, also lower the barrier to entry for customers who don't have uh, the Kubernetes skill set. So in terms of code changes, I wouldn't necessarily say that there are any that I can think of off the top of my head. Perhaps if you're using things like Dapper and Kata, you'll have to think about how you would um, modify your YAML to fit within the Kubernetes, uh, the Azure Container Apps Deployment Manifest. Um, but if your container can run on AKS, it can run on Container Apps. Um, I say that now, right? That's pretty. That's a pretty bold statement. But generally, that should be the truth, unless there's just defects that um, you know that we still have to work through or blind spots that we have. Um, but yeah, code code should work the same as long as it's in a container. Um, you'll obviously have to think about how you'll inject environment variables. If you're using things like, um, you know, secrets um, in Kubernetes, you'd have to think about migrating those to app, uh, Azure container app secrets. Um, 
but yeah, I don't, I don't really have any specific code level change you'd have to think about. Um, I guess if you're running on a Windows container, you'd have to move to .NET 6 <laughs> or some type of like Linux supported, um, yeah, Linux containers only. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm trying to say. So I guess if you were on the Windows side of the house and you're running .NET, you'd have to move to .NET Core or .NET 6. Um, I guess that would be one code change I can think of. Okay, cool. So building mod on modern, building modern apps on open source. Uh, so we've built on top of Kubernetes. Um, obviously, one of the benefits here is that as contributions come to Kubernetes, as uh, as features come to AKS, as changes come to Dapper, as changes come to Kata, all of that being open source, you'll see that implemented into our uh, you know our system downstream. So that's one thing that I really appreciate is that you can directly Con, uh, contribute to these open source projects. And once again, we're going to be able to expose some of the benefits of um, you know, the management of AKS without you necessarily having to do the cluster upgrades and some of that other management. Um, and then we also have Envoy. So in addition to you know being built on Kubernetes, having Kata, having Dapper, we've also baked Envoy into the product. And that really is what's doing all of the ingress. So for example, this would be a challenge for customers who need really granular control over um, like engine, they want to bring Nginx or they need to modify every single thing on the ingress controller, right? We're not, we're not exposing that capability. Now, what's nice is we can take feedback around the core capabilities, right? Like the 80-20 rule, right? 80% of customers need to do to be uh, to have this capability to unblock scenarios that Azure Container Ops is aiming to support, then you know we can consider as a team exposing those capabilities. But I think we have to. That's going to be a fine line that we as a team have to have to be very careful and cautious about. And, and all of our decision making is how do we still make sure that we're targeting this as a platform as a service offering to really um, provide a need for customers uh, versus trying to expose every possible capability within AKS, which if a customer needs that, you already have AKS and you can use that just fine. So uh, core scenarios that we're focused on, um, microservices, obviously event-driven processing with the uh, integration with, of Kata, uh, public API endpoints, um, and one of the capabilities here that Envoy enables and that we do expose is traffic, um, traffic splitting. So if you wanted to say, uh, you know, update a container app, make a change to your uh, your application image, and then do some type of HTTP traffic split on top of these uh, to send traffic and to do blue green uh, or to do some type of A/B testing. That's a capability that we provide. Um, this is another area where we're really looking for feedback and considering ways that we can optimize the revisions experience and clarify uh, great use cases in the documentation. So, any thoughts around this would be great, and we'd love to hear them. And then background processing as well, because unlike Azure Functions um, or some of the other platforms that you can do background processing on, uh, we don't enforce timeouts, which is going to be hopefully one of the benefits to having these long running processes. And that's a great question. So we just had a question from the chat. Is this implemented using Flagger? It's actually not, but that is something that the field has surfaced up. It's like, hey, this would be so cool if we could implement Flagger here. It's actually not implemented using Flagger, um, but it's a great suggestion and just like a great, great question um, and certainly something that I think would be interesting to, to take back to the team to consider. Um, another question before we keep moving from Philip, I know the question is annoying. Do you know the time frame for managed identity integration? I would say, I, like, do not quote me on a specific timeline, but I would say within a month. So it's coming soon, I'll say that. Um, and once again, I'm caveating this now with do not quote me, that is not a guarantee, but we are actively working on it and it's coming very soon. Um, I also wanna take a second here before we continue to let my teammate Mike introduce himself. Um, he also joined the call, I wasn't sure if he'd be able to make it. So Mike, would you wanna come off and introduce yourself and just tell the audience a little bit about your background at Microsoft um, and you know, anything else you want them to know? Sure, thanks, Kendall. Um, yeah, I joined a few minutes late, sorry about that. But yeah, I'm Mike Morton. I recently joined the PM team on the container apps. Um, Kendall's been graciously uh, teaching me the ropes. Uh, my background is many years uh, on the Visual Studio side working on, and the VS Code side working on the container tools. So my previous team owned all the container tools in VS and VS Code along with some of the other tools in the past, service fabric tools and stuff like that. Uh, we actually did do some Dapper uh, tools also, so I'm uh, very keen on Dapper uh, as Kendall is. So great to join the team and uh, hope to work with you all uh, going forward. 
Thanks, Mike. Yeah, awesome. And that's, I think that just goes kind of beyond too. So we, um, and I'll, I'll, I have a slide up about this as well, but we're building, you know, we built out a PM team. So it's no longer just myself and Daria, who's my manager, but also Mike Morton and Anthony Chu. Anthony has been really involved in the community, has contributed a lot to Azure Static Web Apps and Azure Functions, was previously a cloud developer advocate. So we have a really solid team of people who are, you know, ready to hear anything, any feedback you have on Twitter. We're ready to go. Okay, awesome. So um, I think may maybe there was one more question. I just want to check the chat and make sure there's not. Okay. So for there was a question for auto scaling. Anything more than basic CPU and memory, but things like pod count, custom metrics. Okay, yeah. So like let's let's clarify this just a little bit, just to be clear. So because Kata is built in out of the box, we basically have multiple scaling options. So we have a an HTTP scaler. Um, which is really what works best with revisions, and that's something that we're, um, you know, that we're continuing to consider. But HTTP is obviously, you know, one of the core that we provide, and then basically we have Kata powering both event-driven CPU and memory. So you could scale based on CPU and memory, or any event-driven scaler that Kata supports. So we're using this instead of just like the custom metrics for HPA. But if Kata supports it, then hypothetically we should support it unless it's documented. Um, that is the goal. Uh, Jason asked if there will be any access to an Envoy dashboard. Once again, great question, Jason. I, I don't think there's any plans for that now, but I think that's a great potential suggestion if we could find a way to provide that um, in a secure fashion. Uh, so that's something that I'll take back to the team. Um, and and I don't know if I can get I don't know if I can get back to you directly, but I'll take that feedback back to the team because as of right now, I would think the answer is no. Can this work as a multiple AKS cluster alternative, i.e. use AKS in main region and container apps for DR? I would say no, at least not right now. Like it's, it's an interesting question, um, but because the platform is fundamentally different, it would be kind of saying like, hey, can we go from, uh, you know, running an ACI and failing over to app service, right? Like if they're two fundamentally different services, um, I do see the merit there, but because we're not using the same deployment primitives, like you couldn't just take your pipeline and point it, point it at container apps. You'd have to have different deployment mechanisms or at least like a different uh, deployment manifest. So I, I think there would be some challenges there, but it is an interesting question. Um, but I would say, no, it does not work as a, um, a multiple AKS cluster alternative right now. I mean, now, another thing that would dictate that is what capabilities are you using in AKS, right? Because that's going to be a definitive um, answer regardless, right? If you're using a feature that AKS supports that we don't and you need that in production, um, then I would say it's probably not a great alternative. Okay, cool. I think we touched on a couple of questions. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the hosting options. Now, this is just my personal perspective, and I do think that there's a need for a bit more guidance here. Um, but I'm just going to touch on this at a very high level. So I, um, embarrassingly enough, I did a podcast my first week as a PM on Azure container instances, uh, excuse me, on Azure container apps, and I called them Azure container instances. So I, as a PM called them the wrong name. So I will forgive everyone for the first 10 times that they call this Azure container instances. Um, but Azure container instances is still an Azure service. It's not going anywhere. Um, but I did want to talk about when it comes to microservices and hosting options, um, why this isn't necessarily going to be a great alternative to AKS for customers that are looking for less operational overhead. So Azure Container Instances doesn't provide provide service discovery and it doesn't provide auto scale, which are two of the things that make um, the platform hard to adopt for customers that need the scalability of Kubernetes or that need their services to be able to communicate with one another. Um, one of the, some of the benefits, though, is it does provide Windows container support and it does have Hyper-V hyper isolated containers, which guarantees you that um, multi uh, that secure multi-tenancy at the hypervisor level um, by providing that lightweight utility VM. So that's something that I think Azure Container Instances is really uh, compelling for. And then when we think about Azure App Service, there are some scalability constraints because customers will typically try to deploy microservices and then when they want to scale, they have to scale out their entire app service plan and they can't get that independent scalability of each specific um, microservice. Uh, which is is one of the constraints here. There's also a feature that's um, Docker Compose support, and it's been in preview for I want to say at least a year. That might be that might be an understatement. Um, however, this is something that the team is not planning to GA. And so when customers come to the platform, they might say, "Oh, well, I could just use my Docker Compose and deploy it to Azure App Service." 
Um, but really, the, the goal of that Docker Compose implementation was to provide support for sidecar containers. So, you know, if you had one application container, like a Windows container that had some type of like log, logging sidecar, you could deploy those using Docker Compose. However, they are working on an alternative to continue supporting uh, you know, single container workloads with supporting sidecars um, that will be a little bit less convoluted and hopefully help make this um, decision path a little bit more uh, streamlined. And obviously, Azure App Service provides support for Windows, which we don't currently provide support for. So um, in terms of Arrow and AKS, I think there could be, you know, there are full sessions talking about the differences between Arrow and AKS, so I'm not going to try to to go through those now. Um, but obviously with Arrow and AKS, you are using pretty, um, I would say specifically with AKS even more so than Arrow, you're really getting the direct upstream unopinionated version of Kubernetes. Um, and you can obviously bring different things to the platform through these extensions and these core capabilities that we provide to help you do um, you know, have less management overhead. Arrow is a lot more opinionated about that and obviously does integrated CI CD and has its own container registry and all of that stuff. Um, but the thing about AKS that I think we need to keep in mind is that it's really extensible and it has full parity. So if, you know, if your number one concern is vendor lock-in and you're running Kubernetes in every cloud provider, then I can imagine that the current iteration of Azure Container Apps is not going to be an ideal solution for you because it doesn't currently have a multi-cloud uh, implementation or you know integration with Azure Arc. So this is something we'd be once again really curious to get feedback for is like could you see this or would you be interested in this being something like an Azure Arc extension or um, you know or what that might look like right how are you planning to do portability is it Kubernetes being the um, the level of abstraction where you just deploy Kubernetes manifests across multiple Kubernetes clusters or do you see Azure Arc as being a control plane for you to deploy and manage you know Kubernetes across multiple cloud providers. So this is just, you know, one of the things that I wanted to call out. Obviously, Azure Container Apps sort of, to me, fits the bridges, the gap between Azure Container Instances and Azure App Service and AKS. Like, this is really where it should fit is probably the third the third thing here. Um, but, you know, once again, this is more opinionated and still, you know, be, would be interested um, in, you know, thoughts and opinions on this. So let's see, I'm going to go to questions a little bit. Um, would be nice if Microsoft had its own troubleshooting container with tools that are loaded that can be launched ad hoc in any of these platforms. So I think that's a great, it's a great call out. Obviously, right now in AKS, you could do that with you know your own custom like exec container. However, we are personally working on something for Azure Container Apps. So one of the weaker points of the preview so far, and one of the big points of feedback from customers and internal folks alike has been the lack of observability. Um, customers who are trying to understand what's going on in their cluster that are getting kind of generic error messages back and don't necessarily know the best way to, to look through the logs or to figure out what's going on in the environment. So we're working on a console logging experience and sort of an exec container experience as well. Um, log streaming, all uh, better visibility into Dapper and Kata. Um, hopefully some portability or extensibility from a, uh, from a logging perspective. Like all of these are things that are for sure on our radar. Um, so I think that's a good call out. Okay, so Jason asked uh, the, the question that I knew would come from this audience, and I, I'm going to be as tra transparent as possible um, in how I answer it. So what, what is the isolation like for container apps? Are the container apps environments different than a different AKS clusters under the covers, or is it multi-tenant clusters? So in the current implementation, it, it, we are providing a single AKS cluster per customer. However, in our consumption and serverless plan, we're not guaranteeing single tenancy. Uh, this will not, the single tenancy guarantee um, will come potentially through an isolated or a single tenant hosting option. Um, however, we're not guaranteeing multi, uh, excuse me, single tenancy in our serverless model. So what that means is as we determine and solidify our hypervisor level isolation technology that we are going to implement on the back end. Um, we will transparently communicate or you know, integrate that with customers who are running on the serverless plan. So there's going to be a lot of communication that happens around this, and this is sort of a gray area for us right now. But what I can tell you is um, transparently right now, customers are getting their own Kubernetes cluster, and we will not migrate to any other back end solution that does not provide secure, hardened multi-tenancy. Um, and that will be a transparent um, migration path for customers as that gets introduced. 
So I hope that answers your question. We're not doing any kind of like logical isolation of within an AKS cluster. It's not like, hey, you know, customer A gets a namespace, customer B gets a namespace. That's not how it works today. And when we do provide an option or an isolation answer for you, it will be secure multi-tenancy. Um, it will not be logical. Um, and then it says, looks like we will create a container app for each service. Will be super cool if we can take existing AKS manifests and automatically create container apps. Yeah, I, I don't necessarily think that will happen. Um, like to be completely honest with you, and I just think it's because if customers are already have fully fledged AKS manifests, um, they're most likely comfortable with what AKS provides and maybe potentially leveraging more of the platform than we're going to expose. But I see, I see the core need, which is we need a way to do portability and migration to and from container apps to AKS and vice versa, potentially. And I agree. Like, I, I think that that's a tooling opportunity for us. Um, there's another question, does container app support persistence? Um, we are working most likely in the first iteration to provide Azure file support or capability. That's something we're still investigating, but most likely that would be iteration one um, of providing some type of state, stateful persistence. Um, so we'll be using like a, you know, amount um, for Azure files. Um, we don't have current implementation on the backlog for like persistent volumes. Um, that's just something that's, that's not currently there. And frankly, I would say that this really is targeted more at stateless workloads. Um, and that's, that goes without saying um, probably, but that is what we're targeting. But we are trying to provide some flexibility there. Um, okay, cool. Jason, did that answer your question? I know that was probably a bit convoluted. I'm happy to um, you know, re-emphasize anything that might be confusing. No, no, that was cool. OK. Any chance there will be a GitOps-like extension added? So this is, once again, from it's so funny because we get such different feedback and questions from customers who are new to Kubernetes that want to use microservices that see the platform, and then obviously customers that um, have like AKS um, experience. So it's an interesting question. The challenge right now is like GitOps is very much based around I have Git I have a GitHub repository or some kind of repository where I have DAP, like I have Kubernetes specific YAML manifests that are syncing directly into the cluster. Like that's not how it works today because we have our own custom CRDs as part of the implementation, and therefore we're taking and we're using a lot of like Azure native like resource provider concepts. So like for example, in Azure Container Apps your container apps actually have an Azure identity themselves. So like, unlike, you know, obviously with pod identity, there's that concept, but a pod won't like show up in the Azure portal um, the way that like we, we will have a container app show up as almost like a first party citizen in Azure. Um, so I, I get the need there, like the core, um, yeah, GitOps needs the Kubernetes control loops, exactly. So like, I get the core need and the ask, which is, is there a way that we can get GitOps-like functionality to easily integrate directly into the container apps environment? Right now, I feel like that's gonna come more through GitHub integration and like automated pipelines than it will some type of like GitOps. Um, because we couldn't just use like the open source GitOps providers in, in the current state. Um, okay, there was another question that said, you can get persistence in Azure container apps with Dapper components, right? So let's be really clear. So like persistence in the container apps environment versus persistence outside of the container apps environment. So our so stateless workloads, meaning I can access my state in an external source, right? Cosmos DB, Azure storage, um, blob, whatever that might look like. Um, intra cluster persistence that y'all are thinking about like PVCs or like NFS shares, those kind of things. That's what we talk about when we're talking about like intra environment persistence. So yes, George, you 100% can use like state store via Dapper. It just won't be hosted in the um, same like environment where the container is running. Um, another question for Dap, and I hope y'all are okay with me just taking questions because I honestly think this is the best possible use of time and then I'll pivot to a little bit of um, the roadmap that I can share. So for Dapper's distributed tracing, so for Dapper, is there distributed transaction support in future? Okay, wait, I was thinking tracing. So for Dapper's distributed, is there distributed transaction support? I'm not 100% sure I get the question. You can use transactional state stores. So if that's what you're asking about, that is a capability that's enabled for a few of the Dapper state store impl uh, component implementations. So if you go to their, um, if that's what you're asking, I think it is. It sounds like that's what it is. Um, 
let me see, Kata question, would Kubernetes events be added? I.e., I want to do something based on pod density on a node. So we're not exposing the concept of nodes. Um, so probably not, right? Like, I guess you're saying based on Kubernetes events, but but most likely no. I don't think this would be applicable because to you, it's just going to look like a limitless node. That's like, I mean, that's essentially what the goal is here, right? With serverless, like it's similar to ACI that's running on the virtual node and AKS. Like that's sort of the experience that we're trying to provide to you. Um, so there would be no concept of I need to auto scale a node because we're, we're auto scaling with limitless scale. I hope that makes sense. It's a serverless model. So, so no, I don't think there will be any kind of pod count scaling based on a node. Um, are there any other questions? People can come off mute too. We're getting good questions here. Okay. Okay, cool. So, um, I'm going to just switch over and talk a little bit because we only have a few minutes left. I want to talk on some specific things here. So one thing I will say, actually, let's just get it out, get it out there. Okay, wait, we got another, we do have another question. Okay, the question was more for AKS. Okay, well, fair enough. Um, I'm not sure on the AKS one. I think Kata right now, based on scalers, um, do you know, Dave, if I, I don't know the nuance there, if, if Kata is going to support Kubernetes events within a specific cluster. Actually, you know what? I do know the answer to that. I do know that they're thinking about something that would allow you to do auto scale of nodes potentially before you actually reach a um, like a po full pod density to help alleviate the um, downtime. That's something that Tom had potentially proposed um, and might be on their open source backlog. So I think maybe that would answer your question. So um, that's but that, he's a great person to reach out to on Twitter if you have Kata specific questions. Um, and the Kata team or the AKS team should be able to talk to us a little bit more about their specific Kata extension implementation, but I'm not 100% sure on that one. Okay, are we going to be able to configure what gets logged to log analytics in the future? It does seem less non-app related logs are going are going there currently in container apps, but just thinking how AKS logs can get expensive. Great question. So yeah, we are working on that actually. We're thinking about potentially, and this is once again potential, um, like thinking through like the diagnostic logs type of um, situation. So you know how AKS you can do specific logs from the control plane that you're monitoring and exporting to different um, uh, different invite, you know, you can go to event hub or event grid um, or event hub, I think, um, storage account, like log analytics workspace. So we're working through that, Jason, um, you know, what that might look like. And, you know, who knows, potentially there's options for us to make the logging experience generally better. But I agree, like you're not just gonna, and we're not gonna send you like all these AKS control plane logs period, because they wouldn't be relevant to you. So if there's um, specific feedback you have around that or logs you're seeing that you're like, why is this coming here? Please report that or you know, ping me directly and let me know. And yeah, thank, thank you, Alice and um, others who are answering the question around Kata. Um, that's great. Yeah, I think that's exactly, okay. That's exactly what we're thinking about. Okay, uh, looks like there's some other chat going on, but doesn't seem like there's any additional questions that I haven't gotten to. Um, okay, so I wanna touch on this. So one of the things that we recently announced um, was bring your own v VNet capability. Um, my team and I put this blog post together. Um, I'm, I, I'm taking some of the AKS knowledge I have. I know customers have asked, hey, are we gonna have like, outbound type of UDR and what is all that going to look like? And I promise we are uh, working to document what will and won't be available within container apps. Um, we are providing a way for you to have a single static IP address for the container apps environment. We are providing ways for you to um, remove all of the public IP addresses for inbound. Um, so that's all available through this bring your own VNet integration scenario. But for customers who are doing like hey, we have our app gateway and we want to restrict all traffic through Azure Firewall. A lot of that is something that we're still working to document and think through. So um, TBD, um, but just wanted to be transparent there. Um, another thing that I wanted to call out, if you have been playing with container apps, we do have a breaking change coming. Um, and a lot of this is just based on some, uh, like a migration from a particular namespace um, on the resource provider. 
And so instead of using Microsoft.web Azure container apps, or excuse me, container apps, you'll now use Microsoft.app. Um, that change is coming in March. We have a great announcement on it. Um, so make sure that you check out that issue. Some high level roadmap items that we are committed to. So readiness and liveness probes that are custom, um, obviously that namespace migration, um, some of the quotas and constraints that we have like two environments for uh, per um, subscription or you know the number of replicas that can run. We're working on VS code and VS tooling. Um, we're working to enhance GitHub action integrations, um, supporting gRPC for Dapper. I think that, ch that change got checked in. Um, we are doing observability enhancements, managed identity, custom domains and bring your own certificates. Um, so these are all things that we've already publicly committed to, which is going to be any item on our backlog that has the roadmap tag. Um, okay, last couple of things since we're all out of time. How can you connect with us? Uh, Discord would be great. We have a Discord channel if you're running into issues, if you're troubleshooting, if you have suggestions, if you want to meet with us, feel free to ping us on Discord. We have a Dapper channel. We have Maybe we can create an app portability channel as well. Uh, we have a mailing list, so we're going to send out you know, anytime we do major feature releases, when we have major announcements. Um, and then if you have issues or feature requests, um, we just got a new issue and feature request template that I put together yesterday. So feel free to submit those to, um, to oh no, Jason, it's great. I'm glad that you're talking about container apps with people. Um, he said he has a presentation tonight, we love it. Uh, feel free to reach out to me too, if you need anything or if there's good feedback that comes out of it, we'd love to hear it. Um, so yeah, public roadmap, we're, you know, Obviously, I care a lot about AKS, and that's why we've done these public calls. And hopefully, we're going to continue to marry that same type of enthusiasm over on the Container Ops team uh, now that I'm a PM over there with, with Mike and, and Anthony and Daria. And then other things. We have, uh, obviously, play around with the features. Like, look at the documentation. Give us our, your feedback. Um, and then we have a public roadmap. Um, so if you're interested in checking that out, as mentioned, uh, that will be available to you. So we're out of time. I know there was a lot of great questions. I'd love to keep talking, but I think we, we covered a lot. Um, if you'll want to connect directly with the PM team to talk about you know, anything related to container apps, you can directly email me and we'll get something set up. Um, but we'd love to connect with you, you know, out in public and just figure out ways that we can make this a great experience for people on Azure, um, whether they're brand new to Kubernetes or, or uh, you know, maybe coming from AKS or potentially looking to grow into AKS um, and just need sort of a stopgap solution until that time comes. So whatever the need is, we want to make sure that we we do we do the service justice and all of our customers justice. So uh, thank you all for joining. I'll stick around if there's any more questions that come in the chat. Um, that's all I got for you. Oh, let me let me drop the links. I'll drop them in the chat right now. Yeah, any update on the not pre-allocating IPs for AKS subnets? I do not have an update on that. I'm so sorry. Um, I wish that we did, but I don't have an update on that, unfortunately. Thanks for having me. We'll see you next time. Thanks for joining and for all the great questions.